as a musician, you are very aware of the fact that there are tons of scams out there to the point where it's easy to feel really paranoid that anyone talking to you about your music career is out to get money from you or is trying to deceive you. Well, I want to ease your mind because there really are about nine common music industry scams. And if you're just aware of these, I think it will help you decipher between the scam artists, those who are wishing to do you harm, and those who are really just trying to help and also offer services as well that are beneficial to you. So I hope this is helpful to you. I'm Becky. This is the Empowered Indie Artist YouTube channel and podcast. Let's get to it. So nine common scams in the music industry. I'm going to start with kind of the most obvious to the not so obvious. So number one is emails impersonating a record label saying, um, we think your music is fire. I'm the uh, senior VP of A&R at Capitol Records, and they might even use the real name of the real senior VP of A&R. And for a $500 submission fee, that's you know a modest $500 submission fee. I just saw one the other day, and I'll actually post a picture of it in this video so you can take a look. Um, there's a few red flags. First of all, record labels are never going to reach out to you in this way, and they are never going to charge a submission fee. Zero, never, ever. So it's usually a major label that they're going to be impersonating a, someone that you could just Google and say, oh yeah, that really is the real person. Um, so again, this record label is never going to approach you directly in this way. They're never going to charge a submission fee. And also you can just kind of tell by the poor grammar and the spelling mistakes that this is not a legitimate email. Number two, birthday song scam. This has become so cliche that it the subject matter has been banned in certain Facebook groups. Like, don't talk about it anymore. We've heard enough. But essentially what this is, is someone will message you and say, hey, do you write custom songs? And you may say, yes, I do. As a matter of fact, they say, great. I would love a birthday song for my child. They're turning eight and they like these kinds of things. Will you please write this song? And you say, sure. And you're taking notes. That'll be... Um, you know, they'll say, I have $300 for my budget. And you're like, okay, yeah, I can do that. The scam happens in the way that they pay you. They will try to, it's kind of that typical scam of trying to get you to refund money that's extra. And in actuality, the money they sent you was fraudulent. So they may say, oh, I can't use PayPal or I can't use Venmo can I send you a money order, but I only have it for $3,000, so I'll need you to send me the $2,700 back, something like that. Uh, different variations. Now, this scam has become so well known that I think scam artists are going to be twisting it. It may not be a birthday song. The problem with this is that there are true legitimate requests for customized songs. There are artists and musicians out there that are offering customized songs as a service. So you really just have to beware. As soon as anyone tries to pay you and asks for, um, oh, I accidentally overpaid, send me some money back, you just want to cancel this transaction completely. Number three, an email or a message on Instagram that says for $20 a month, we can get you, you know, 10,000 guaranteed streams. Any service that is guaranteeing streams or followers is not legit. And this is because there's no way to guarantee streams or followers. If you think about the fact that what you're trying to do is share music with people who will like real people that will really like it. Um, how is there a guarantee attached to that? If your music is really not that good and you're having a hard time getting anyone to pay attention to it, 
or even if it is good and you're having a hard time getting anyone to pay attention to it, how is it that this company can guarantee that you're going to get all these followers and all these streams? Well, the answer is bots, okay? So just eliminate that, stay away from that because, um, you know, some of these streaming platforms like Spotify, they really are trying to take down these bot farms or any profiles that they see that look like they're not legitimate people. Um, they're trying their darndest. And so our way of helping Spotify eliminate these things, which is, you know, it's, it's against the use of the terms of use for Spotify for one to pay for streams. So just don't do it. We're going to help the ecosystem as independent artists if we don't contribute to this madness. All right, that's it on that one. <laughs> Number four, if you receive a message on Instagram or an email and they're inflating your ego, telling you how amazing you are, they might even say one of your song names by name, like I listen to such and such track and it is just amazing. But a lot of times they don't. They'll just say, hey, I listened to your music. You really got something special going on. This tactic, they just inflate your ego and what it might end up being usually. Um, and they may not really be clear in the email of what they want from you or why they're reaching out to you. Um, but they might. So it'll be something like, we want to help you move your career forward. I'm a manager or I own a small record label and they might drop some names. What they ultimately want is for you to pay money to submit your music. Any company that is asking you to pay money to listen to your music. Now that's different if it's like a review. If they're going to give you professional feedback and that is the service they're offering, you might have to pay for that and it's worth paying. Um, but if they're asking for a submission fee or an administration fee for us to consider your music, any kind of verbiage like that, you just want to avoid. I would say avoid paying anyone money unless it's a person, an organization, a business that you have done some deep research on. And, you know, even just a simple Google with the company's name, the person's name, and maybe even put scam at the end of your Google search, you're going to find out really quickly and easily if this is a legitimate person and company. I've had, I've, I've been in Facebook groups where people say, hey, is this person legit? And I've just like, no, oh, let me just Google this person's name or the company's name. And I mean, all these like, don't do this, don't work with them, they're scams, blah, blah, it pops up. Now you're going to get negative reviews. Every business is going to have, you know, a negative review. That's normal. But if you see people saying, you know, they took my money, they promised me this, they promised me that, and then they just ghosted me, you know, those are the kind of businesses you want to stay away from. Number five, pay to play. Now this one is tricky because it actually is going on a lot. It still goes on. It's been going on for decades. It used to be, well, payola is a term that was coined back when um, the only way for an artist to really break into the mainstream was to get played on the radio and record labels would pay radio DJs money or perks to play their artists on the radio. It's been illegal, it still is illegal, and yet it still happens. So if you're like wondering how can I possibly get on the radio, I don't, you know, I'm not signed with a major label. Well, you're right. It's really hard to get on the radio unless you have deep pockets. And of course, they will deny that. Now, the other pay to play option is usually uh, with bands. If a venue is saying, yeah, we want to have you come play at our venue, um, it's going to cost you this amount. That's usually not cool. What venues will normally do is take a portion of ticket sales. Now, if 
I am an individual such as myself, I've done this before where I want to put on a show, I want to host a show that has my artists, um, I will pay the venue for the use of their space. And then um, usually there's not a ticket sale split in that case, they might want to still negotiate something there, but that's okay. Um, but any kind of like oh pay us thousands of dollars and then you can open for us on tour those happen it's shady it's not supposed to happen and it will stop happening if people stop being fooled by it okay you hear what i'm saying stop paying to play or doing gigs for exposure okay i mean i understand i've done plenty of free gigs and as a matter of fact i donate probably 20 hours a week to sing in a choir that it's really, really hard work, but it's my own choice. I love the choir. I love um, my church and the mission that it's on to spread a certain message. And so I donate my time voluntarily. Uh, if you want to play at a gig because it's for a fundraiser event that you really believe in, do it. But anybody who's like, yeah, we want to have all these bands, but we don't have a budget, just avoid them because they'll get the picture. If if bands continue to jump on these like, oh, it's the opportunity kind of thing, then venues and promoters and people like that, they're, they're going to continue to take advantage of bands and artists. So if we just all say no, guess what? They will have to pay. <laughs> but I mean, it's least we put so much work into you know, learning the instruments, putting the show together, hauling the gear, renting the gear, having a sound person. There's so much that we invest into putting on a show that absolutely you should never feel obligated to do it for free. Can you do it for like, well, just cover my expenses? Yeah, that's totally up to you. But really, we need to be paid. Musicians need to be paid. Okay, I'm off my high horse now. All right. Number four. Um, now this is, again, I, I started at the most obvious and we're coming into the more vague. Now you may stumble upon a small independent record label or a producer that has legitimate credits. They've worked with artists that are household names. They might throw you a contract that's like an artist development contract. Now these guys in and of them themselves are not, you know, scam artists, but they are going to try and take advantage of your ignorance. And so what they might do is have an agreement that is vague in some very, very specific points, such as who owns the masters, who owns the publishing. If you read the contract, you do not have to be a lawyer, but if you don't see anything about who's owning what, or you see some kind of vague leaning towards them owning everything, then you want to run away, okay? Or just say, I am going to have my lawyer look at this. And then they might be like, oh, okay, fine. Um, or they might say, oh, no, we don't need to get lawyers involved. If, if they say anything like that, um, or a lawyer looks at it and they're redlining the whole thing with all of these comebacks, and now your, you know, famous producer is saying, oh, well, I don't want to do business with someone who's going to be so, you know, anal about everything. Run away. You don't want, basically, they're saying, I want to um, take advantage of you because you don't know. And in the end, you're going to owe me every dime that you ever make in the future. That's essentially what they're doing and you'll be on the hook for it if you sign that agreement. Now, um, a good lawyer for you, which might be an expensive lawyer, could probably take them to court later after the fact and, you know, say this agreement is vague and it's, you know, criminal. You might win in court, but you don't want to spend hundreds of thousands of dollars to win in court, right? You just want to avoid these situations. So eliminate any type of agreement that is um, leaning in their favor of owning the publishing and the master recording, okay? And if they're not willing to negotiate, just say, all right, adios, you do you, I'll do me.
Okay. Number seven. This one's a little tricky because a lot of um, artist coaches, a lot of producers, they want to get on a phone call with you, which is great. I do that too. Anybody reaching out to me that wants to talk about making music with me, I want to get a sense of who they are. Um, but some people will want you on this phone call so that they can snag you, okay? If you get off the phone call and you feel your head is spinning and you're like, what did I just do? I gave my credit card number and I just spent $5,000 on this coaching program and I don't really know why. <laughs> um, if on the phone call they're using intimidation tactics, shaming you, or they kind of do a bait and switch where you thought you were having a phone call about a certain service and all of a sudden you're, you know, there's a 180 and you're now buying some product that you had no intention of buying. If anything like that is happening, um, you want to run away from that person. So it's not the phone call in and of itself, but just know that some people are very talented at, um, at manipulation <laughs> and they can more easily do it on a phone call than they can in an email exchange or a text exchange so just be wary of that number eight and this one is definitely trickier uh, this is a slow methodical building of trust and after a relationship has been established someone might do a bait and switch on you uh, I've, I've seen it happen I've been in the room when it's happened. Uh, a common one is at the end of a production, when you're listening to a final mix, that producer will say, okay, great, now tell me your release plans. And you say, oh, okay, well, here's my release plan. And they say, well, do you have a publisher? And you say, well, no. If they then say, well, you need a publisher and I'll be your publisher. And you're like, well, I'm not interested. And then they hold the master recording for ransom until you agree to make them the publisher. I have seen this happen more than once, and it's criminal. So a producer, if you have agreed to pay them a set amount, or you've agreed to pay them points on the master recording, or a combination of both, it should all be agreed up front at the beginning of the process of producing the song. If they are changing the terms of agreement at the end and holding the master recording for ransom, I think that's like one of the most horrible, deceitful things people can do. And the only thing you can do about it is threaten to take them to court. I don't think there's anything you can do unless you've signed an agreement ahead of time that says once they're paid in full, they will deliver you the master recording. If you have that agreement, all you need to do is say, hey, this is what you agreed to, dude. And then hopefully they'll say, okay, fine. Um, if they continue to hold the master recording for ransom, you are gonna have to sue them. And that's really unfortunate, but hopefully it won't get to that point. Just know that if anyone is trying to pull this, they're not an ethical person. And sort of an extension of this is number nine. And I also saw this. It was before I really understood music publishing. Music publishing is very, very complex. As the songwriter, you automatically are the publisher. Now, back about um, just a few years ago, actually, you if you didn't have a publishing entity formed, there were certain royalties that you could not collect. Um, but you can easily form a publishing company. That's not hard to do. And uh, you just have to know that you have to do that. Now, since 2000, I think it was 2019, um, the MLC came around and it's the Mechanical Licensing Collective. It is specifically for self-published songwriters. So I had a company say, well, we'll be the publisher because the money's got to go somewhere. And at the time, I didn't know that, well, it does need to go somewhere, but it could go into my bucket because I have a publishing company. I already did have a publishing company, but didn't really understand what they were saying. So essentially, if anyone tries to tell you the money's got to go somewhere, 
let us be your publisher, um, you can just say, hey, I've got a publishing company. Even if you don't, go start one. <laughs> it's very easy. And if you don't want to start a publishing company, that's no big deal. Just sign up for the MLC. And now the MLC, which is a nonprofit organization, their entire being is to help self-published songwriters collect those mechanical royalties that used to only go to a publishing company. So no one can use that excuse on you anymore. No one can use that manipulation tactic. You can collect the songwriting royalties, the performing rights royalties, and the mechanical royalties as a songwriter and as a publisher all by yourself. You don't need any publishing company to help you do that. Okay, I hope that was really helpful. I know that was a lot. There's a lot of gunk out there, but if you have the knowledge, if you know your business, then you will be empowered to make good decisions and hopefully avoid any of these situations. Let me know in the comments below if you've had any of these scams handed to you. If you've had to go to court to get your master recording, I'm really interested to hear your stories. Thanks for joining me and I'll see you next time.